Nashville Design Week is a platform for bold collaborations and conversations that promote idea sharing, engage and educate the public, and strengthen our city's design culture. We shine a spotlight on designers who are shaping the city's future and facilitate critical conversation about the industry's growth and impact. 2020 has challenged us in every way. A tornado, a pandemic, and a long overdue reckoning with racial inequity. And as we close in on a formative election, we are excited to focus on the power of design to reshape communities and to actively support equity. We are proud to introduce a diverse range of speakers covering everything from racial injustice and inequity to diversity and inclusion, connectivity, and allyship, all through the lens of design. We are fortunate to partner with design leaders who are invested in the future of Nashville's design community. These leaders see Nashville Design Week as essential and support making design discourse accessible to all. Thank you endlessly to our 2020 sponsors for helping us bring Nashville Design Week to life. Thank you to founding silver sponsor, Hastings. Hastings is a boutique architecture and interior design firm of 75 professionals who are deeply committed to the service of clients, producing award-winning, thoughtful, and impactful architecture. Thank you to silver sponsor, Watkins College of Art and Amore College of Architecture and Design at Belmont University. The Watkins College of Art and the Amore College of Architecture and Design celebrate the power of art and design to transform people, communities, cultures, and the world. Thank you to our copper sponsors, Elevated Outcomes, Interface, Smith G Studio, and Textures Nashville. Thank you to our bronze sponsors, Aberdeen Studio, Alfred Williams and Company, Circa Creative Studios, Dade, EOA Architects, Earl Swenson Associates, Emanuel Zeitlin Architects. And thank you to our media partners, Dezine, Lightning 100, and Nashville Interiors, and to creative directors, Lindsay and Alan Lasseter. Nashville Design Week is proud to be a fiscally sponsored project of the Arts and Business Council of Greater Nashville, a nonprofit organization. Nashville Design Week is an entirely volunteer effort made possible by the tireless dedication of our team. Now, let's get started. Well, hello everyone and welcome back. Thank you so much for that intermission. And thank you to Donna and for her panelists. And I would like to just start by introducing our next uh, host and group of panels for the Socially Conscious Art and Design. Um, and I'm gonna start with just introducing Rob, Robert uh, Jones, who will be joining us shortly. Robert Jones entered the art world as a graffiti artist in London's street art scene of the early 2000s, working on a variety of commissioned murals and graduating from Brighton University in 2009 with the Bachelor of Arts. He relocated to Nashville in the summer of 2010, working in several arts-related positions before moving to Washington, D.C., where he spent five years working as a picture framer and freelance artist. He returned to Nashville in the fall of 2017 to found Overton Arts, in this capacity, he has helped to organize a number of events, including the Germantown Art Crawl and founding the Germantown Movie Night in 2019. He became the building manager for the 100 Taylor Arts Collective. He has recently expanded Overton Arts to house his art studio and showroom, where he showcases works by himself and several other local artists. Hey, Robert. Hey, Paige. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, sticking around for uh, the second panel, Conscientious Art and Design. Um, so yeah, just a, a little bit more uh, about me. My name is Robert Jones. Uh, I founded my business Overton Arts about three years ago. I primarily do picture framing and uh, arts consultation, uh, but I also work on my own art. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll put up a little, some slides here. Um, some of my own artwork um, and I also lean into like programming events pop-ups and 20% of my profits this year are going to uh, Gideon's Army to support their ongoing efforts to rebuild North Nashville um, so and hey guys we've got some panelists here now um, so what's gonna happen I'm gonna give a, a quick overview of the panel just for about five or ten minutes or so um, and I'm gonna introduce all the panelists we have uh, we're going to get into a, just a discussion for maybe about 30 minutes, uh, and then we'll, we'll do some sort of audience Q&A at the end. Uh, so bear with me, please. Um, and uh, OK, so 
About seven or eight years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine about our favorite books. And she pointed out to me that the majority of my favorite books were written by white men. And she challenged me to seek out more minority and female writers. Now, I felt defensive at first because I wasn't being discriminatory. I just read what I came across and I liked what I liked. But I took her up on her challenge. And as a result, some of my very favorite books now have been written by women and minority writers who just wouldn't have been drawn to my attention if I hadn't consciously sought them out in that way. And I think that's a really good example of how even when we're not doing anything wrong personally, uh, we can still be exacerbating these sorts of social issues. So the premise of this panel is to discuss the value in being more conscientious about the art that we purchase, both as individual consumers and especially within the design community. Um, so first things first, please buy from active and local artists, because ideally when we buy um, art for our walls, we're also investing in the arts community. Um, if we want to have access to great art and a great art scene, uh, we need to invest in our artists. Now, I think it's also really important to be mindful about diversity. As I said, most of us are not going to actively discriminate against anyone. And so our assumption is that we're not part of the problem. But just because we're not doing anything wrong, that doesn't mean we can't still be part of the issue. And I hope that this panel will demonstrate the value in preemptively considering diversity, uh, because I want to talk about the benefits of that. And I'm going to do so from uh, the perspective of an arts consultant. And I think that uh, Stephanie in the, in the last uh, panel touched on a lot of this as well. Um, and, and I thought that was really interesting. But, um, you know, I see art as a window into our society. Um, and what we value determines what we preserve for future generations. So when we invest in art, at least in a small way, we're participating in a census of our society. If you take any collection of, of Western art, then the vast majority of the work will have been created by white men. And that means our perspective of history is limited. Now, we often assume that what's going to speak to us is going to come from a very similar perspective to our own. But I don't think that's true. I think that uh, a good art has universal appeal. And I think the mark of a well-curated public collection is one that can pick on a number of contrasting pieces to give a nuanced range of perspectives on any subject. And that really requires uh, a real diversity in the artist represented. Uh, obviously, in terms of race, gender, and sexuality, but I'm also interested in factors we don't discuss as often, like uh, age, class, religion, and geography. And an artist living in a small town, for example, is gonna look at things very differently uh, from an artist living in Manhattan. Uh, but we tend to take for granted that if art was created outside of a major city, then it must be unsophisticated, which just isn't true. I don't think these thoughts need to dictate every purchase we make, but I do think that there's a value in just being mindful of these things and pushing yourself to look outside of what's immediately accessible. In terms of the art itself, it's easy to fall into the habit of finding a style of work that just clicks and coming back to that over and over again. Uh, and I see that a lot within the interior designer community. Uh, I think interior designers are artists and the rooms and environments they create are pieces of art. But I do think you can counter issues when the overall composition of a space always takes precedence over the finer details. If you're thinking a blue painting to balance out this room, you don't necessarily care about the messaging behind that piece. You're just looking for something and the right color that looks good and isn't gonna compete with the rest of the room. So it's easy to go to an established decorative artist who you know can create that piece on demand and it's gonna look great. And sometimes that's gonna be the right call to make. I love decorative art, um, but I think the one we're putting together spaces, uh, it's all about balance and it's all about contrast. And if you always go in that same direction, then your spaces will begin to feel interchangeable and overly formulaic. I use the term art to describe any artwork that carries some kind of a message behind it. And I know that narrative art can be distracting and it requires a little bit of extra effort, especially if it's going to be in a public space where you're trying to please everybody. Uh, but it can also really help to elevate our public spaces because ultimately, if artwork has a message, then it's going to make people think. And that makes a strong impression. And even if that message itself uh, doesn't quite hit the mark for everybody, I think that everybody still benefits from it. Uh, and by and large, people respect that and appreciate it. Um, so that's kind of my introduction. That's kind of uh, my case for uh, why we should be more conscientious about art. 
Um, if you click on the, the, the handouts tab of the screen, I've actually uh, attached a, um, a download. It's, it's basically an artist directory of artists in Nashville. It's pretty basic. Uh, one of my big goals for uh, 2021 is going to be to put together a, a kind of a professional publication of arts resources and artists in Nashville with photos and bios. Uh, that we can just sort of send to, you know, interior designers and consumers uh, just to really, uh, I, I feel like we have so much, so many great artists in Nashville, um, but it, it's it's hard to find them. We don't have that framework uh, in place. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we've got uh, all of our panelists here now, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and introduce you guys. How you doing? Um, okay, well, first we've got um, Alishaba Mozek. I'm gonna pull up some of her work now. Um, uh, Alishaba is one of my favorite artists right now. Um, she's a phenomenal tattoo artist, founder of One Drop Inc. on Jefferson Street, uh, an organizer and anchor of the Jefferson Street Art Crawl, uh, and a fine artist in her own right. Uh, her current exhibition, uh, Blood at the Root, which she created with her husband, Alan, is, is on display at the Frist until November 1st. Uh, so please catch that if you haven't already. Uh, then I'll go on to Sarah Lederach, uh, is a fiber artist, a curator and events producer. Um, she's always working on awesome stuff. She's the co-founder of the East Side Art Stumble and Gallery La Perca. Uh, she's hosted a number of shows, uh, including for our last uh, 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 host, Donna Woodley. Uh, and most recently, uh, her show Face Value is a virtual exhibition of pandemic masks. Uh, then we have Amari Booker, uh, who I see Amari everywhere. Um, he's constantly doing shows. Um, every time I open a magazine, I read a new write up about him. Um, so uh, Amari, uh, yeah, we, we hosted, uh, we, we spoke together at Pachaka Chow at the Frist last year. Um, his last show uh, was on redlining over at Channel to Channel and his latest show called Need a Hug uh, is showing over at the new Black Box Gallery uh, in Salem Town. Uh, and then finally, May Huan. Uh, May is, there we go. Uh, May uh, works as an optician and found her business chart op optical in 2017. Um, she works with a socially conscious business model and founded the Sticky Rice Collective in 2016, which supports and uplifts Asian American artists and entrepreneurs in Nashville. Uh, the Sticky Rice Collective uh, has held a series of pop-up art events, as well as holding a presence at the Jefferson Street Art Corps. So, hey guys, how are you all doing today? So we have... Good, wonderful. Perfect. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, for does anybody me. have any thoughts first off or anything to, anything to add to that? It's just great to be here. It's good to see all of you. Thanks for having this talk, Robert. Oh, absolutely. Well, you, talk, you guys too. Um, well, I've got a few questions written down just to get sort of a discussion started. So um, I guess first off, in terms of like diversity, um, how good or bad a job do you think that uh, the Nashville art scene does in terms of diversity? And, and what do you think we could be doing uh, to improve on that? So, you know, Nashville has such a wide array of diverse artists but when you, you know, see articles or you see, you know, show openings, it it's really not highlighting every kind of corner we could be reaching. And there are only kind of certain areas that um, kind of concentrate other types of artists that are outside of that kind of mainstream art culture. And so I really think that it would be something great if the gallery scene and the people who have the spaces to show art could start coming together and, you know, meeting and, you know, cross, you know, promoting their artists within the community so that different artists who, you know, 
are only shown in this one kind of geographical area of the city can, you know, be spread to other areas so that other people can find them and know more about their work. And if gallery, you know, owners and, and um, people with spaces to present art, you know, can come together and form, you know, uh, an alliance of sorts, I don't know, that basically elevates the entire art community here and gets a wider a range of artists and types of art from all kind of cultures and backgrounds. would be just like a, a, a thing that really needs to, um, I think, take place in Nashville in order to help with that diversity aspect. I think that's really true. It, it it often feels like we're all on one team because the arts community, like, you know, everybody, right? And like, we can text or call everybody, but it, it is very, uh, like little clicks of people in different parts of the city. And it would be really cool to see more cross collaboration. It's tough. I'm like, I'm a gallerist without walls right now. And so like when I throw a party or do an event or a fundraiser, I always uh, just make the asks of people that I know are going to say yes and are going to make good on, like if I say, will, will you give me a piece of art for this? I need it by November 14th. I tend to just ask folks where I'm like, okay, I know that they've got stuff on hand and that they're going to say yes to me and they're going to have it to me. But it's like, I know that it's my responsibility to start like looking outside of the circle of folks who are always going to give me a yes so that I can make sure that when I do have an opportunity to showcase other people, I'm doing that. You know, one thing I've found with doing the Jefferson Street Art Crawl, because we're dealing with artists who don't necessarily have all of the know-how of how to set up a show or how to contact a gallery to, you know, get in to be a part, um, it requires a lot of patience on the gallerists and the, you know, people with spaces to present arts and in order to be able to walk kind of people through how to do a show right. So I understand why we, you know, go directly to people who we know what they're doing, but at the same time, how many people who just need that extra kind of hand, I feel like we miss out on um, because they don't have those necessary resources, you know, from a place that can uh, actually help them. So I feel like, you know, as you said, we we really have to just start looking outside of those, okay, I know this is going to make a good show and take that challenge on of, well, this might end up not being exactly what I wanted or might end up being more work than I planned. Um, at least, you know, sometimes in our, you know, yearly scheduling of shows just to give an opportunity to somebody who otherwise wouldn't. When how exciting is it when you find somebody whose art like you really vibe with that you've never seen before? It's like thrilling. It is. It's always fun to be a part of that. I, I feel like um, Nashville has a, a, a so as, as we've all said, Nashville has so many great artists. I've, I mean, I've lived in, I've been involved in so many different art scenes from London, DC, um, you know, New York a little bit, and, and Brighton, other towns in, in England, and I, I really feel like. The, the, the quality of the artists in Nashville um, is so, so high, but I feel like we, we don't really have an art scene. Like, I feel like, it, not that we don't have an art scene, but it's it's not as strong as, as you know, a lot of those other places. And I, I think that, um, you know, if you're looking at, like, galleries, where we're talking about what galleries can do, but a lot of that also comes from, you know, when I was in, in London, there'd be all these cool pop-up events that weren't necessarily run by galleries, they were run by sort of organizations of just loose collaborations of artists doing kind of cool pop-up events. And I don't see as much of that. Like, what do you think, outside of the gallery scene, what, 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 would, what do you think we could be doing there? Well, I think that what you said about having a singular portal or a singular database where artists and galleries and art collectors can all just know that's where you go if you're looking for art or if you're looking for your art to be seen. I think that's gonna be a really big part of it. Um, also, a lot of the big gigs for art, you have to fill out a lot of paperwork for, or grants. You have to fill out a lot of paperwork for that. And wouldn't it be great if the artist had that paperwork primarily done 
at one time and then it was just ready to go the next time that a big opportunity came up and it was ready to be previewed by people looking for artists at any time, you know, 24 seven. So I think having that type of organization, that type of system would be really important. But I also think that when it comes to diversity in the arts here in Nashville, um, a lot of that is something that the artist himself or herself really needs to reflect on because I feel like while the black community does an awesome job of, you know, um, talking in a really authentic way about culture and about, you know, issues that matter in the black community, what I see in the Asian community and some other diverse communities is there's a little bit of a, you know, too much of a tendency to over assimilate or, you know, really just head straight into the commercial zone or try to you know, create art that they think is you know, accessible. For instance, uh, the I Believe in Nashville murals are, are done by an Asian guy. You know, an Asian guy came up with that. But you, you, I don't really feel anything particularly Asian about that artwork. It's a, it's a, it's been a huge commercial success. That. That's great. I know that. Huh? Yeah, he's Asian. I didn't know that. Like, I feel like I should have been aware of that. Um. Yeah. yeah. So it, there's, so I don't, I, I don't see out of the Asian artists in Nashville, you know, not nothing against that, but it's just something I've observed. I'm, I'm aware of it that, you know, I see a lot of non Asian stories in, you know, Asian work. And I, I would like to see more. I would like to see an Asian story from someone who's got one. You know, if you don't have one, that's fine. But if you have an Asian story, don't be afraid to, or, you know, some other you know, diverse story, don't be afraid to share that story. And, you know, don't let the Nashville skyline be the first thing that you paint. You know, I think when it comes to narrative art, we're talking about you being authentic to your story. And if we have more of those stories, um, that's where the diversity in art comes from. And then we can figure out a place for it to go. But if all the if so many diverse people are creating non diverse art, then I think that's a that's a problem. I I gotta jump in here, and I think a big part of the reason people gear away from making that diverse art is because people aren't getting paid for it, and that's where we have to go back and we have to start doing like Stephanie Pruitt Gaines talks about getting people to want to collect this type of art instead of them just going for the basic kind of no, Nashville skyline. I know I'm going to get somebody to buy that, you know, but I can't say that I'm going to get somebody to purchase a piece about my black struggle with something internal. You know, that's a different type of audience who likes that art. And most people, you know, are looking for a buyer anywhere. So like we need to also, I think as artists start really engaging with the community and the way they value music artistically here in the city need to be the same for visual artists in the city. And if we can get people on board with understanding the value of purchasing art for uh, appropriate prices and supporting artists the way that they support musicians, that would change and people would be freer to create those really authentic stories that are, you know, for them rather than just to be able to sell it for, you know, money to eat and money to survive. I mean, we really just going to have to just really start engaging with the community to end this starving artist narrative that just continues to hang over every artist of every color's head. So, um, we touched a bit on, on, on narrative art then. Narrative art um, is, a, is a phrase I used to describe, just any art that has some kind of a message or thought behind it. Um, what, what, does, uh, what does narrative art mean to you? Um, and, and do you like to see sort of narrative art? And, and like, when, when do you like to see narrative art? When don't, are there times that you don't like to see that? Yeah, I mean, I would jump in, kind of like May was speaking to, um, just art that tells an authentic story. Um, and so when she's speaking about art artists that are that um, that are kind of showing their their own cultural relevance, that is, you know, that's just telling whatever their authentic story is. I mean, as there's black artists that may not, their authentic story might not be a stereotypical black story. Because what is a black story? You know, what is an Asian story? It's, it's whatever is is true to you. 
but for me, that's the artwork that has long-term value. I mean, how many people are going back and saying, I could have gotten a Jacob Lawrence, I could have gotten a Kerry James Marshall, I could have gotten an Aaron Douglas, like people that were telling stories in their artwork. And I mean, those are just a couple of examples of, of um, again, African-American artists that were making work that, I mean, anyone who's seen a Kerry James Marshall, and if you haven't, go look them up, you wouldn't put that in a hotel, but there's a lot of hotels that wish they had bought that $5,000 piece that's now $250,000, you know, artwork. So, so, um, so kind of back to that art business side of it. It's not, for one, I, I personally like work that does tell a story. I also like work that's visually appealing and I think that you can marry the two things. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's the, I think when we're when we're kind of talking about getting collectors and businesses and designers, I mean it's National Design Week. I mean part of the, I think the mistake is putting too much responsibility on the artist and not looking around at the community that historically hasn't supported artists. I mean it's always been a hierarchy, you know, hierarchy where the museum dictates the gallery, the gallery dictates the you know, the apprenticeship this takes the artists, you know, and the artists have always been at the bottom of that um, totem pole. So I think trying to flip that and, and empowering, it is up to us to empower ourselves, but it's also up to the people around to say, yeah, we're going to invest in this thing that we know is important and not use it as a, as a way of, okay, I'm the, the institution in power, so I can kind of pluck the things that, that I deem valuable. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think putting too much responsibility on the artist to get the work to the people and not enough for the people to come to the artists are, um, I just think that's a bit of a mistake. Yeah. I, th I think that's definitely a, uh, some, a lot to be said about being, um, more, um, you know, thinking about what it is that the, in, in a lot of times, for example, um, there might be artwork that's um, that people that, 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 that might seem on the surface, it might seem intimidating and, and scare some people off, um, uh, or, or especially if, if you're doing a big sort of public installation in a lobby or, in a, you know, in, in like a shopping center or, a, or whatever it is. Uh, something that's going to have a lot of public engagement. Um, for example, if you look at uh, the series of paintings that, that Donna showed of hers, um, of it was it was uh, black female portraits with, uh, you know, with like underwear. It, it might seem like, well, this is something that's clearly not. That's going to be way too controversial for public space. But once you actually like analyze it and you, you talk about it. It's actually there's nothing there's nothing that's that's that doesn't work there. There's nothing that there's no reason that shouldn't be in a public space, and and when you read it, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense. It, it, it's it's very um, you know it, it's got a powerful message behind it, and I think that's the sort of thing that we we should see more in public spaces. But far too often, you'll see something big that has you know a very inane message if any message at all it's just going to be something that's completely calming and abstract that just you know nobody's going to complain about it but also it's not that engaging yeah absolutely and i just kind of wanted to speak to one other thing that may um kind of just just said was thinking about what we consider um what things aren't palatable, what things are too controversial to put in public. It's like if you're an artist in Nashville of Muslim descent and you want to express something about that in your artwork, it takes very little for that to be, oh no, well, we can't put this in the space. You know, if you're doing portraiture and the portrait happens to have a, a big afro, then there are a lot of places that, but if we really think about I mean, well, there's there's really nothing there's nothing wrong with with the, I guess there are a lot of things that there that really aren't off putting that we consider off putting before before we even give them a chance to live in um to kind of live in the world.
So anyway, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but. Yeah, I think that, you know, all too often I see art in public spaces where, you know, there's no, I, I don't know, there's, you just, you, you kind of expect it. You're know, like, okay, yeah, this is pal palatable to the, you know, kind of sort of basic country music scene that, you know, the tourists are here for, but, you know, it would be nice to be surprised by what I see in public spaces. It would be nice to, to stop and say, wow, I wasn't expecting that. And for some reason, you know, I think that Nashville has been you know, too hesitant to, to do that, to have, have something that's more surprising and different. I also think that we kind of shy away from possible confrontation that certain narrative pieces can bring because we are such a varied society and we just we want to go on about our business and not have to deal with implications of um, freedom of speech that happens when you put narratives out there because there are just so many points of view and narratives and there are so many things that could trigger um, things in people and galleries and public spaces are kind of capitalist spaces in that you, the people in the public are the customer and you want to keep the customers happy. So you don't want to necessarily challenge them or make them, you know, truly think about the things and issues that, you know, would be addressed in a lot of different types of art. And which is why we have the galleries and the museum spaces so that people can go there specifically to be challenged. Although I do believe that absolutely should change because part of the reason we're keeping having just problems in society is just that we don't challenge ourselves and we always want to be comfortable um, and don't want to, you know, fix problems. So changing design to be challenging rather than just comfortable would be really a great thing to happen in a city like Nashville. Absolutely. Something that Stephanie Pruitt Gaines said in the last session with Donna that I wrote down that I felt like she like just distilled it was it's obvious to me that a lot of people haven't been in a space where Black Lives Matter. And so that to me, that's an opportunity for narrative art to create spaces that say Black Lives Matter here. Let's look around the room and see what I value. This is what I voted on for my walls and start those conversations. And there is also, there's, there's a, a lot of, um, you know, whenever you do have something that has some sort of a narrative, some sort of a message, of course, there's like, to what you're saying about, um, you know, people want to avoid that confrontation. There's always going to be somebody who's going to, just by default, who's going to disagree with that message. Um, but, but how do you work with that? I, I think that, um, they can be part of, they can be the most valuable part of the audience because you're not trying to sort of hammer home ideally you know i don't think many people are talking about putting in a, a like a biden harris mural permanently in like a in a public space or or, or or conversely a trump mural in a public space it's a lot of these things don't necessarily need to be overt political messages it can just be kind of social commentary and if somebody disagrees with that message you know, how do you want to sort of start a dialogue with them? That, that you, you don't want to turn them off. Like they can disagree with it and still find value in, in, the, in the message. I find that really funny that, you know, you were saying that we're, that doesn't mean putting the big Biden or the big Trump. And yet, I like they put in a big Biden house meal. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, but just like, but we are anyway, like we literally see giant political right. advertisements and polarizing things every single day in our news feeds, in the billboards, in the street, you know, just everywhere we see these messages and they're not artistic. So why not have those out if we're going to allow giant you know, billboards on every highway that scream a message one way or the other. Why not have it be, you know, something from an artist from their heart and soul rather than just the propaganda um, mm -hmm. that's funded by these big dollar, you know, billionaires with their own agendas to make more money? Yeah. Well, I think that um, the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of artists in this this year have been really good about you know sharing their heart and about voicing you know their opinions and you know, sharing their identities and 
you know, not being bashful about it. And that's been really great. And I think that a lot, the most of what that does is it bolsters the, the base. It gets people that were formerly like, oh, I actually to spend some effort on this is like, yeah, it's kind of woken them up. Like, okay, I can actually, I can get involved too. I don't have to just sit around and stay quiet. I think that what Robert's bringing up is it's not just your base, you know, that, you know, public art can, can reach. It's, it's the opposition. You know, so, so is it worth it to have that conversation with the op opposition and, and not have your, uh, all of your artwork be kind of anti-opposition. So I think that this year has, there's been a lot of cancel culture, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's good to say, hey, if you're, uh, if, if you are spewing, you know, racist or harmful or violent, you know, uh, information, we want to turn that off. Like the mute button has started to work really well this year. And I think that that's good, but it's also an opportunity to create artwork and create conversations that are palatable to people of the opposing, um, you know, uh, philosophy. So for instance, you know, I, I, I've noticed that a lot of, um, opposition to, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is coming from a, a religious, you know, standpoint. Like there's a lot of like, you know, kind of a, like a right wing conservative Christian, you know, demographic, for instance, that's, 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 that's coming up with, you know, um uh, reasons to trying to come up with reasons to be in opposition to a phrase like black lives matter which is you know quite ridiculous to me um and so what i find especially from being from Tulsa Oklahoma i'm i'm from a very you know conservative um place and i've i've lived in Nashville now for the last 15 years and most of that time i've spent in north nashville and um I've been able to hear both sides of the conversation really well. I'm very, you know, um, I've been very good at listening to uh, my friends in, in the black community and artists in the black community, what their, you know, um, viewpoint is. But I've also heard so much of the noise from, you know, the opposite viewpoint and they don't think of themselves as racist. They don't wake up every day and like, man, I'm so racist and my life is great. You know, <laughs> like they, they're, they're influenced is coming from their parents and their pastors and their peers. It's the PPP. It is not good. And um, what what can your art do? What can this movement do to, to put yourself in a, a higher position of influence than their pastor or their parents or their peers? And that's what I haven't seen a lot of yet. I've seen a lot of, you know, artwork that is moving the base, but I haven't seen a lot of work that is an effort that is actually moving and changing the opposition. That, that's what I want to see. I want to actually see some people really change. And, and, and that's where we're going to, you know, see evolution, you know, in the future of really kind of attacking where, where racism is. If we can get them get them where they're coming from and actually understand. I, I see what's going on here. Your, your church is actually telling you that you're better than other people. And so how are we, how can we stop and think and spend a lot of time on how to address the, the, the you know, conversation from where it's coming from on, on the other side. Um, so yeah, that's something that's been on my mind this year. Yeah. You want to go? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm gonna say, don't you? No. <laughs> no. Well, no. I'm just, I'm just glad that May brought that up because that's literally the things that I was thinking when me and my husband collaborated on this piece that we have up right now at the Frist, and it's really about getting people on that opposite spectrum. That's not me preaching to the choir as I do, you know, as we all do, kind of speaking out of ourselves to people who think like us, but we really wanted to get them in a space by themselves to be confronted with these things and have the opportunity to acknowledge and see our point of view, you know, and then be able to come out and engage with somebody of color who is affected by their viewpoints personally in a non-threatening way, because the way that the you know people who are oppressed are going to talk to people uh, is going to be a voice of of hurt and anger and why don't you understand and you know you make them feel attacked when you're screaming and yelling for your freedom which 
is right, our right to do so. But at the same time, if you actually, you know, want to get someone to listen, you have to approach them in a different manner and give them the opportunity to actually hear what you're trying to say in a way that they can actually hear without being so defensive. And I really agree with what you were saying there. And I would love to see more people looking at how their art can do that, especially using narrative art to get that point across and art in public spaces. So, Mari. Absolutely. It's a, um, that, that, that's a lot. I, from, from my perspective, the responsibility of awakening white people is off of the backs of black people. Any of my white friends out there, it's on y'all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you collectively got to get together and do that work yourself. It's been 400 years of us telling you our lives matter. It's time for y'all to sit in that room and look at each other and say, what are we doing to make this continue to happen? Like that's, that's the, so I think that that's my only kind of, I mean, I'm going to express the ideas that I'm going to express and I, and I hope that all people kind of take it in and, and, and kind of kick back what, what they, um, I hope it resonates and, you know, I'm definitely not, not, uh, hope to not beat anyone over the head, but, um, but MLK, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, like generations and generations and generations have tried this thing of, let's see if we can get white people to care about us. Fuck that. White people get together and care about each other and then figure out if you can care about us too. So yeah, it's, it's definitely just kind of beyond, um, and that's, and that's actually, that's agreeing with what May and Alicia were saying. I think the beautiful thing about Blood at the Root is 50% of that project, at least, is, is a white male's perspective, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so it is getting in that room and saying, how can, um, what can, what can we do about this race issue that, that we created? Black people didn't create a race issue in the United States. So why is it always on our backs to fix it? It is, and I, I just uh, saw uh, Blood on the Root as well, and I, I think what is, if, if to anyone who hasn't seen that yet, um, please do, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, I was saying to Alicia, but what's, what's really interesting about it is it, it's the conversations that you hear in that exhibit are so, um, they're so universal amongst, because it, it's not sort of necessarily overt racism, it's all kind of, just little, just not seeing the, the, com the, the complexities and the context that make something, you know, saying um, the N-word versus calling a white person a honky. Well, why, why, how come you can say that, but I can't say this? And it's like, well, technically, you're right. They're just two words that are both divisive words that you use against somebody's skin color. But if you don't see the context, they're the exact same thing. But the context is everything here. Like the context is why, you know, if somebody calls me a honky on the street, I'm not offended by that because there's no context of oppression there. That it just doesn't mean anything. Um, it's just a word, and 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 that, you know, that 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 was that was really interesting. And and blood of the root is that I think those conversations are all su such kind of common conversations that are just easy to ignore um, in, in certainly in, in the white community. I think we're sort of primed not to offend each other and not to talk about things. And so it's important that as we're making choices as curators and in the design of our own homes that we are making sure that we're making choices that encourage conversations that are hard. You got to practice having hard conversations. It doesn't come easily at first. And so like you keep trying it better and better and better at it. And we can do it with art. And I'm just being a little bit mindful of time here. So I'll move on to an, another question is, um, you know, that we Nashville has, has, has seen so much change over the last 10 years. You know, we've seen, I, I moved to Nashville first in, in 2010 and I've, I've been coming back, back and forth all my life. But, um, the last 10 years, especially, you know, the level of change that we have seen in 
terms of downtown and Germantown and, and the golf and everything. There's been so much development pumped in. It seems like the the art community has, has largely been left out of that. Um, what do you think that this this sort of new Nashville um, can can do to make more space for the existing arts community? It feels to me like there's a lot of money that's moving into town and there's a lot of money that's being made on our spaces and on like just on the value of what we've created. I've been living here for 15 years and so it's I'm not a native by any means, but like the reason that Nashville is so attractive to folks that are coming to town and folks that are investing money here is because of what we were doing in the first place. And so as those walls are built that are excluding a lot of us just financially and it like culturally, it's not a place that maybe you would choose to spend time. There needs to be a lot more intention by designers and the people living in those spaces to to spend money on local artists and support the like the reason that y'all want to be here is because we're cool. Put our art in your walls. It's easy. Bed Bath and Beyond art is like schlocky. The skyline. I'm so tired of the skyline. We did. My partner Katie and I did a whole show that was Nashville without the skyline, just to see what people would come up with like five years ago. I'd be interested to see that again now because it's like, what are we now five years later? We're something completely different than we were in 2015. But it feels like you need to like you you owe it to the people that were in the spaces you are in now to to spend money on them. I, I tell you what, in, in, in 20 or 30 years time, though, all of these and I see so many great artists who because of the, uh, you know, just the complexities involved in trying to just survive as an artist, uh, as, a, as your primary primary source of income. I see so many great artists who do create really interesting work. When they go to like an art fair or an art market or an art call, they're just churning out a bunch of, you know, skylines because they know that's what's going to sell. They can churn them out real quick and, and, it's, and, and that's, that's how they pay their bills. And I think we all kind of, get frustrated about that but you know in 20 30 years those are going to be collectible because looking at a skyline from from 2015 when of nashville is is going to be real interesting to look at dang batman building is still going to be there like you can still see the batman building from all these other yeah well i think part of what has happened with the new nashville is that there's been a lot of investment into spaces that are not exactly relevant anymore you know i think a lot of the big buildings have gone up for instance are you know for a lifestyle that we might be you know all but saying goodbye to i mean like you know i think that the work from home model for a lot of these big businesses is going to continue i mean there's a lot of businesses that you know i mean billion dollar businesses that have told their employees you now have the option to work from home for life like we're going to guarantee that for life now and since that is the trend um you know i think that artists can think about that too like if let, let's just hypothetically say that you know living and working from home is going to continue so then we can think about gallery spaces in our homes you know and then you know a person just with a house and not necessarily a commercial real estate you know um property can think about like oh i could i could get involved too because i have wall space and i could you know have a smaller group of people come to my house, for instance, there's a bill passed this year that allows you to have, you know, up to, you know, six groups of visitors per day. You could have like a six appointment art gallery, you know, and have a, a deeper conversation with them about the art. Um, an artist could do that too. An artist could have a, a workshop or a gallery and, you know, do business in their home. So I think that there's a new, new Nashville. There was a new Nashville that's, you know, of course been developing in the last decade or two, but now there's a new, new Nashville that's going in a completely different direction. I, and I think that digging into our neighborhoods and our, our you know, kind of more micro communities and, you know, uh, having art in our homes and having art in public, like outdoor spaces is a really good place to invest time because um, if, if COVID continues to be a problem and, you know, walking around inside of indoor, you know, buildings is not going to be as much of a thing, then yeah, I think that's a, a good place to look. 
and what do you think? Uh, so, if if you if you want to sort of support the arts community in Nashville, and you don't necessarily, you know, you're not an interior designer with a big budget who's putting together spaces, and you're not a private collector with a lot of money. If you you know you you're just you have a, a modest expenditure, you're not going to be spending lots on art. What what can you do to support the arts community if you don't have that sort of financial power? Well, you know, I think the arts community in Nashville specifically is really reachable once you go to all the different kind of fairs and events and stuff that people do have. And you can actually talk to the artists and see, you know, what they have. And maybe they'll even work out payment plans with you or something where you can pay on a piece until you own it uh, or, you know, um, create smaller, more affordable pieces or try to just talk to you about, you know, what you want to spend and if they have any pieces that they would sell to fit your budget. And you don't have to bargain with the artist or, or um, go back and forth trying to debate with them over their pricing, uh, which you should not do. Uh, <laughs> just plain and simple. If somebody says that this is what they want for their work and that is what they feel like it is worth, you can accept it or not purchase it. And you don't need to um, waste your time trying to barter with somebody over their product. And so, but you know, if you go and you talk with the artists um, or even a representative of the artist about what your budget is for art and what your goals are for collecting uh, this person's art, you know, I'm sure there are different ways to work that out. And I mean, yeah, and so many different price points, you know, based on the fact that you love that art and that artist and their work and you want to support them. Because most artists, they want to sell to people who love their art and not just people who want to buy it because of whatever kind of um, credentials they have or where they have shown, but who actually have a connection to the work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would just kind of echo that, that it's really accessible. The artists in Nashville, like, I mean, going to any, you know, any fair, festival, student art, you know, the, a lot of the schools have um, art shows, Lipscomb, USN, MBA, uh, but there's also Jefferson Street Art Crawl, East, East Side Stumble, Wedgwood Houston. So, I mean, I think when you go to, and a lot of those are virtual now too. So even just looking at a virtual art crawl or a couple of the past virtual art crawls, and if you see an artist you like, you know, follow them on Instagram and send them a message. They probably live down the street from you <laughs> or within a 10 minute drive. So, so that's, um, and like you said, the price points are very flexible. If you're not looking for originals, you can usually buy prints or reproductions from 25 to 50 dollars a piece and frame it and that's you know you can kind of start wherever you are so um so yeah it's definitely it's it's an accessible i think the artists in nashville are as accessible as as any other place and which is why we all have such a good relationship i think with each other because we we do all kind of know each other so even if you just meet one or two of us we can tell you who the rest of us <laughs> or who, who a critical mass of um of other artists around are so yeah, slide into the DMs with the artists, and you usually, like, if you don't ask, the answer is no, so it's always worth the ask. Yeah. Folks will make time. And some of the galleries have, like, payment plans. Like, I, can, I know that Channel to Channel has, uh, like, like layaway plans for you. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you, like, you have your gateway prints and you want, like, an original piece, then, like, you can, people will work with you because, like, they want your, they want you to, like, love the work that they've made and want it to be on your walls. You could also do like, get a group of friends together. I change the artwork out on my walls constantly. Get a group of friends together and buy some fabulous piece and start a collection. For sure. Yeah, it doesn't cost anything to have a friendship with artists or to have you know a relationship with the arts community. So, and like you're saying, it's so accessible. Um, even in, in the pandemic, you can look through all of the past art crawls, like the Germantown art crawl, Jefferson Street art crawl, downtown, Wedgwood Houston, et cetera. And there will be so many artists featured that you can start to figure out who you like and what you like. And then you can literally just send them a, a Facebook message and say, I really like your artwork. And I, I've made a lot of friends that way. 
Um, and when I have money to buy art, I buy art. But whenever I have not had money to buy art, um, I've been really clear about that. And I think it's good to be clear about that when you're, you're making friends with artists, because obviously if you say, I really like that. I really like that. It's like, okay, do you want to buy it? <laughs> you know, like, obviously they're going to probably wonder that. So if you don't have a budget, you can tell them like, okay, I don't have a budget right now, but um, I can help introduce you to, you know, so-and-so because I work in such and such industry and I know all these people that blah, blah, blah. Like, so maybe you can help introduce them. Um, I once helped uh, an artist get a gig because I heard that the Tennessee Immigration and Refugee Rights Coalition was hiring artists to paint murals on their new building. And so I let, you know, a lot of my artist friends know, and some of them got hired for that. You know, I felt really good that, you know, I was able to help, you know, book that gig just from, you know, paying attention to what's going on on social media. That was something I saw on Facebook, you know, and I forwarded that Facebook post to, some of my friends that did not cost me anything to do, but you know, to do that, but it made such a big impact on the, the artists that actually got booked, you know, and, and it, if you own your own business, um, then you may have a, you know, something that you can barter. Like some artists are willing to barter. Some of them are like, they really need whatever it is that you have um, and that you can do an equal value, you know, trade with them not not always you know it's, it's got to be the right fit you know they really have to need whatever it whatever service or whatever you know product you have but you know those are just some of the ways that i know that have made a big difference in some of the artists lives that i've you know been friends with okay well la uh, last question before we'll get on to a, a little q a at the end um what would you most like to see change uh, in the in the arts community in Nashville and in the arts scene here? Hmm. So, yeah. uh, go ahead, Omar. You go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would like to see um, galleries, institutions. I think the first is like consistently done a better and better job of engaging with. Um, community, just community initiatives and bringing artwork in that is is right here at home. But um, but I would say probably commercial galleries really um, investing in in exhibiting and promoting and pushing the work that is that's right here. Because I think sometimes you can we we have a tendency to to overlook the stuff that's right in front of us. And um, and so, see, so yeah, I think that'd be that would probably be my the thing that I would like to see, or one thing that I would like to see change. I think like the communities do a pretty good job of putting on like initiatives. I know East Side always has stuff going on, you know, North Nashville, South Nashville. There's a lot of different places that have stuff going on, but um, I feel like that has kind of grown, and a lot of the galleries have kind of done sort of a similar thing to what I've seen in the past five or 10 years. I don't feel like they've grown at the same rate. Um, and, and then of course, like institutions, I feel like some of the universities, a school, a, a city that has this many universities, there's always an opportunity and that's, and universities have budgets, like they have a budget to give an honorarium or do some. So, so I think if you're involved in this with the university and a lot of them do a really great job of that. So I'm not, critiquing it. I'm just saying that's another space. Um, and of course, National Design Week. So we got designers and designers, your your clients will be glad if you introduce them to an artist that they can collect and you don't just put a piece of artwork that is that, they, that doesn't have a link to anything that they can follow and watch it gain value over the years. So, so I mean, I think individuals appreciate being introduced to a, um, a collectible artist rather than a um sort of a random piece of artwork and on that i just want to interrupt on that is um the the handout that i have here i've i've, I've heard that it's that the file is not downloading the reason for that uh, is because it's it's too big for the size limit on here um because i've, I've got a list of about 100 artists with photos and everything um but if anybody does want to get a, a kind of a directory of, of national based artists it's it's pretty rough copy but just uh, shoot me, just just reach out to me. Um, I'm, my email is Robert over to Mars, and I, I'll get that to you. But um, yeah, definitely have him. I think that's what I would like, like to see change most is more kind of cooperation between 
the arts community and designers and architects and schools and, and investors to just try and create more of a, a platform for local artists um, and, 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 a, and a diverse range of local arts, both in terms of, of demographic and in terms of media. Um, yeah, I definitely would like to see more non-working related kind of hangouts. Like before the pandemic, every Sunday um, we would have a kickback here at my shop where local artists would just get together and just hang out without any kind of working, not trying to sell anything, just meeting each other, almost networking, but not even really that formal. And we just had board games and snacks and people just chilled out and hung out and just talked and, and met other people in, um, in a nice, creative, safe space. And I hope that once we can gather again safely, that more communities will start having those so that communities can meet together as well as go join other communities and see what's going on and meet people in a place that's not awkward or that's always welcoming because that's one thing I always look for when I go to a space is does this seem welcoming to me or am I now going to be the thing that's stared at the entire time you know how can we open up spaces to invite a more diverse group of people to be a part and um, in a non, you know, in a, a way that's not going to uh, make them feel like they have to sell all the time, you know. It feels to me sometimes like the ethos of the country music industry just sort of permeates the rest of the city. And so everything like we're expected to like maybe work for free and for exposure and everything needs to be with an agenda and like folks want to be gatekeepers instead of bridges. And so I just kind of would echo what Alicia has to say and say like, we need like more time where we're casually together and being like building relationships because ultimately relationships are what get stuff done. And so like the more, the wider your net is, the just, it's going to be a more diverse and vibrant place to live. Yeah, and I'm only knowledgeable about, you know, the art scene in Nashville just because of, you know, when I first started my optical, I opened it as an art gallery and I was on the Jefferson Street art crawl and, you know, I was curating every month. And so meeting so many artists every month and hearing about, you know, what their struggles are, what their problems are, what their concerns about the neighborhood are, you know, when you really um, have those conversations you and you, and you take the time to listen you'll know, like you'll know what needs to happen in your community and what kind of change needs to take place. So I, I think that, you know, when it comes to what I like to see happen is, is yeah, it's more of those, more, more listening and more of those conversations happening. And what that did for me is that, you know, I already knew, you know, from you know, being a, a minority non-Black person in a, in a Black neighborhood in North Nashville, you know, it was already, you know, very clear in my direction that I, I knew that, I wanted to you know, have a business model that is relevant to the black community. It's, it's a, a business model that serves a black community and a diverse community. And I think that a lot of, you know, um, new businesses I see, you know, pop up, you know, regardless of what neighborhood they're in, I, I just don't feel like that thought was put into it. They didn't really think about, you know, that, you know, relevancy and, and I, I walking in there I, I can feel it I'm like this place is not relevant to anyone except for you know perhaps a you know very you know kind of more white community um, no one else is going to really get into this or be served by this you know so I think that even if you're not a business owner if you're an employee somewhere there's things that you can do that you can learn that just make your business more welcoming and, and more applicable to uh, a diverse community. Again, if you have those relationships and if you're spending time listening, then you'll understand how to serve and how to help, you know, and how to you know, relate to your community. And so that, that goes beyond just artwork and including diverse artwork that goes, you know, it's more about like really being a part of a diverse community and understanding where you, where you are, you know, in the midst of that diversity. So let's go on to, uh, we've just got about uh, about five or 10 minutes left. Let's just go on to a couple of questions. I've got one from uh, Manuel Zeitlin here. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, who asks uh, if, if, if 
you're putting together a, man, a manifesto of what socially conscious art should speak to or what it should contain. What might that include? That's a really big question because there's everything. There's literally like, you know, so many different microcosms within our society and each of them need a focus. And it's it kind of goes back to the whole Black Lives Matter thing and then people saying, oh, all lives matter. Well, yes, but we are taking that microcosm. So when it comes to socially conscious work, you want to do the same thing. If, if the LGBTQ, you know, needs something said about what's going on in that community, even within that community, another specific, you know, a uh, 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 part of that, you know, that could be dealing just with black transgender, yada, yada, you know, so we want to make sure that we're focusing on whatever things need to be said and they could contain, you know, any number of things. There's just so many social and, and, and conscious, socially conscious things that are out there and issues that need to be fixed and addressed. So it could, it just needs to be, you know, somebody that's authentic, telling their authentic story, as May said earlier. And really, we just have to start requesting that kind of work, um, you know, and supporting it when it's put out. And you'll see so much more of it happen because we all have so much to say about our things going on in our lives and in the society around us. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of like what, what socially conscious art should speak to, I mean, I think it can speak to anything. I think it just depends on, I think, I, to your point, I think it should just be honest. So if, if you know, if, if I'm going to talk about socially conscious art, um, you know, I've, I've tried to talk about the importance of diversity from the perspective of a, of a of sort of an arts consultant, but I'm not talking about the... Um, the importance of diversity from a black perspective because I can't do that and I think there's a there's a lot of I think that if you just speak to what you have direct uh, experience in um, and you just speak honestly about that and 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 you're being conscious to your true self then I think that as long as we are all trying to do that and all making space for people to do that, who might have different perspectives from us and different experiences to us, and then that's really, um, I guess that's really what I would would say about you know what socially conscious art should should speak to. I think that my desire for socially conscious art would be that it it provokes conversation and a, a reaction from people. It's not if I as a curator am putting together a show, I want people to come into the space and view it as a unique side of learning and like to, to react to it and maybe they don't agree like i don't know if it's agreeing or not but just to, to have a feeling when you look at it and not just be like well there that that is and that's that's pretty but i would like it to be like okay i guess so i was thinking about it and this is what i thought the story i told myself when i looked at this painting was this and can talk about it with other people right well, I'm going to give, I'm going to, we've got just a couple minutes left. So I'm going to put up a, a slide of just our, our Instagrams. Uh, please uh, show us some love. This is Overton Arts. Uh, Feminist Dad is Sarah Lederach and Amari Booker. Uh, Chart Optical is, is Mei Huan. Uh, and if you, if you need any optical needs, uh, I can vouch from experience. She's the person to go to. And then uh, One Drop Inc. is, is going to be Alicia Buzz. Um, so please show us some love and, and let me know if you have any, I think we've got about two minutes left, three minutes left, if anybody has a last question to get in. But, um, okay. <laughs> page back to, to usher us off. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your time. That was really engaging and an awesome conversation and just appreciate everyone that was able to join us. So uh, thanks again, Robert and your entire panel. And if anybody else wants to um, just participate in the rest of National Design Week's um, events, you can go to nationaldesignweek.org and see the rest of the calendar events. So thank you, everyone, for joining and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Bye.